Good morning, Gardnell Mount Vernon. It is such a great, great day in the Lord this morning. We're so glad you joined us uh, on Facebook Live or however you're joining us this morning. We want to wish all the mothers a uh, very happy Mother's Day, uh, whether it is, is biological or where you're the spiritual mother of someone, which is very, very important too. We thank you so much for your investment in the lives of all of your children, and we appreciate you more than you will ever know. We ask now that you'll join us in worship as we begin this service today and looking forward to uh, the day when we're all back together. Thank you so much for the flat people you've sent our way. If you haven't done a flat person, you still have a couple of weeks to get one in. If you haven't done it yet, we'd love to fill the, the seats in this uh, auditorium with, with flat people for right now. So please send someone and have them sit in the pews with us. To, uh, we'd love to have it. Let's pray and we'll begin our service. Holy God, our Father, we're excited today about you. Father, we thank you so much for the sacrifice you've made for us. We can have life and have it more abundantly. Father, we thank you for our church. We thank you for the people that make up our church. And Father, we thank you for the resources that you have given us so that we can continue to worship together, whether it's in person or online. Father, you've given us those resources. We thank you so much for those who are joining us. And Father, we praise you for the wonderful reception that has been given. Now, Father, as we begin this service, we ask your blessings to Brother Steve as he prepares to bring the message on the group as we, we sing and lead in worship. Father, help us to understand and know that we are your instruments, we are your servants, and we're here to praise and worship you so that our congregation may do the same. Forgive us of where we fail you, and may we have a wonderful day in you. And Father, thank you, thank you, thank you for all our mothers. Amen. <laughs>
sweet the sound, amazing love, now flowing down from hands and feet that were nailed to the tree. As grace flows down and covers me, amazing grace, how sweet the sound, amazing love, now flowing down from hands and feet that were nailed to the tree as grace falls down and covers me covers me it covers me it covers me The next song we're going to sing is, um, it's called It Is Well. I'm sorry I'm going to get a little upset. Um, but God really just put this song on my heart this week because I have been just in the most awful place. And I know part of it's probably the quarantine, but if you're part of the church family, you know that um, my husband and I had a child that died um, tomorrow, nine years ago, and I always get in this awful place, but I have a Savior, and He reminds me that if I ask for His grace, He will cover me, and He is so amazing that when I reach out to Him in my despair, the Holy Spirit wraps me up and lets me know that it's going to be okay. And so I'm, I'm feeling that there's some people out there that Mother's Day is really hard for you. And you know why. And a lot of other people are rejoicing and having the best day. And you're upset and sad. But I want you to know that you have a Savior that loves you. And He can give you exactly what you need if you ask Him. And all you have to do is just say his name, and he'll do it for you. So we're going to sing this song, It Is Well, because no matter what I'm going through, it's always going to be well with my soul, because I'm going to lean on Christ.
Good morning. Good morning to everyone who's uh, with us online. Thank you for being here. Um, thank you. Um, I shared the live feed on my phone a minute ago, and I, I sure do appreciate all the wonderful comments. Uh, keep commenting. Let us know you're here. Let us know you're worshiping with us. We've had so many people visiting us online through worship. It's very, it's very humbling to look at the number of people. So thank you. Happy Mother's Day uh, to all of you, biological and spiritual mothers, uh, to all of the ladies, the women, and the girls who bless our lives. It's a, it's a hard Mother's Day, I know, because we are basically in exile, <laughs> wandering in the wilderness right now. And so thank you for who you are. If you're with us, go to gmvumc.org and go to the, the drop-down menu, go to Connect, and fill out a connection card. Share your prayer requests. Uh, also, if you're able, please go on gmvumc.org and, and go to the drop-down menu and go to Give, um, and you can give your tithes and offerings. Thank you for your financial uh, faithfulness. Thank you for driving by the church and dropping those envelopes in the mailbox. <laughs> Uh, thank you for being a part of the kingdom of God. We appreciate that. Uh, let's pause for a moment and let's pray. Um, Lord Jesus, we thank you so much um, for the technology that allows us to be together in this way. Um, Lord, as your church and as your people, we pray each and every day that you give us strength, uh, that you reinvigorate our hope, uh, and that, God, you're with us each and every day through the power of the Holy Spirit to lead us through the wilderness uh, into the promised land. Lord, uh, for the ability to give, we are thankful. For the blessings you show us, we are thankful. For our family, God, we are thankful. For your holy church, Lord, we are thankful. As thankful people with thankful hearts, God, we pray that you hear this prayer as we give. Uh, Lord, I thank you for those who give and for those who give sacrificially. Bless this offering, Lord. Let it be used for the upbuilding of your kingdom. Let it be used to bring others into your kingdom. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. <music> Still thinking about the subject this morning that Jesus said, uh, even though that he holds the keys to hell and death, that he's given us <laughs> the keys to the kingdom. Still thinking about how very incredible it is that he's given us the keys to the kingdom. Matthew 16 and 19, let's remind ourselves of this verse. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. It's very important for those of us who are kingdom-minded believers and followers of Jesus Christ to think about the things we are binding and the things we are loosening and how that affects those around us and affects our world. In Jeremiah 2 and 6, we are reminded that it is God who leads us. And in Numbers 14, we are reminded amongst the complainers of those who left Egypt, we are reminded that 
God has given us too many signs that he is with us for us to be faithless and for us to complain. We live in the midst of absolute uncertainty in the wilderness. There's all kinds of experts out there that are spouting off that they have the answer. I'll give you some good advice. Don't listen to them. We are truly a church in the wilderness. It's not anything new. We've always been in the wilderness. <laughs> Since Adam and Eve were expelled from the Garden of Eden, we've been in the wilderness, folks. This is just a different type of wilderness. Last week we talked a little bit about manna, and we learned that manna is not a thing, it is a question. It means, what is it? That God was feeding the Israelites by the manna that came down and after the dew dried off, it lay there on the ground like frost and the people went out and said, what is it? And it was their sustenance in the desert. For 40 years, they ate, what is it? And that is sort of where we are at now in, in the history. This is the worst pandemic in 100 years. Think about that. The worst pandemic that we've seen in a hundred years. What is it? What has caused it? All kinds of conspiracy theories out there. All kinds of propaganda mixed in with the facts that we have to try to discern. But the wilderness experience, how is the wilderness experience affecting you? How is the ex wilderness experience affecting us? As kingdom people, as people who claim to be followers of Jesus, how is that wilderness experience affecting us? How is it changing us or is it changing us at all? How is it changing the way we think? How is it changing the way we feel? How is it changing the way we conduct ourselves? How is it changing the way we act? The wilderness is a place, we remind, I remind you from last week, of renewed appreciation and thanksgiving. We should appreciate it that God is with us and that God provides and that God has given us sign after sign after sign of his goodness and his grace and his presence. So the wilderness should be a place to give us renewed appreciation and thanksgiving. Unfortunately, it did not have that effect on the children of Israel, the first generation that left Egypt. Millennia ago, their bones turned to dust in the desert. The wilderness makes us see the difference between need and greed. We have seen people respond during this pandemic simply out of their need, and we have seen people respond during this pandemic out of their greed. The wilderness teaches us how to live one day at a time. We're not promised tomorrow. Why do we think that we're promised or entitled to tomorrow? God is sovereign. He holds this whole world in his hands. We're not promised anything except that he is with us. We're not promised tomorrow. The wilderness teaches us that only God provides. We're not the ones providing anything. <laughs> it is God that created this world and created us. And it is only by his grace that we live. So as we go into part two of the kingdom keepers being in the wilderness... Uh, let's look at Exodus 13. Last week I was in Exodus 16. I'm backing up a little bit to Exodus 13. When Pharaoh let the people go, and boy, there's a whole story behind that. God convincing Pharaoh to let the people go. God did not lead them on the road through Philistine country. Listen, God did not lead them on the road through Philistine country, though that was the shorter He didn't take them the short route. He took them the long route. And a lot of us are getting very impatient in this time with the long road. God said if they face war, because if they go through Philistine country, they're going to have to fight. If they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. He knew the people were not mentally, emotionally, or spiritually prepared for war. So God led the people around by the desert toward the Red Sea. The Israelites went out of 
Egypt ready for battle. Now the Israelites thought they were ready for battle. They went out expecting a fight. And God said, <laughs> you are not ready for a battle. That's why we're not taking the short route. You think you're ready for a battle, but you're not. We're going to do things, God says, my way. And you're going to have to trust me and that I will provide for you. Moses took the bones of Joseph. There's a whole story behind Joseph I don't have time to get into today. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him because Joseph had made the Israelites swear an oath. He said, God will surely come to your aid and then you must carry my bones up from you to you from this place. Joseph, even though he was a ruler in Egypt and it was, the people thrived and did not perish during the times of famine, jo Joseph did not, he knew he was not Egyptian. He knew that the Hebrew people were his people. And he said, when, when God does deliver you, and one day he will, I want you to carry my bones with you because I, I want you to take my remains and bury them in, in, in my homeland. Right? I'll, that's what I want you to do. So they took Joseph's bones from Egypt. Moses... Oh, verse 20, I'm sorry. After leaving Succoth, they camped at Etham on the edge of the desert. They camped on the edge of the desert, and by day, I want you to look at this, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud. A pillar of cloud. How many of you have ever used the expression pillar of cloud in your day-to-day -day life? A pillar of cloud, that doesn't make any sense. Clouds are fluffy. And I lay down in the grass and I look up at the clouds and I can see Mickey Mouse and a unicorn. Over here is a whale. Here's a puppy dog. That's the way we look at the cloud. A pillar of cloud. A pillar is a post that supports a lot of weight. A pillar of cloud. It looked like a post that was supporting the heavens. A pillar of cloud to guide them on their way. And by night a pillar of fire. Now that must have been impressive. To give them light so that they could travel by night or by day. So that they could travel in the wilderness by night or by day. In the daytime they saw the cloud. In the nighttime they saw the fire. It gave them light. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. When the kingdom keepers are in the wilderness, let's think about clarity, clarity in the clouds this morning. So whoever you're with at home, just look at them and say, what do you see in the clouds? What do you see in the clouds? The primary guidance system, that God didn't, have, God didn't give them a GPS, didn't give them Google Maps. The primary guidance system was a pillar of cloud. What are, what are your clouds this morning? What is it that guides you? Who is it that you are looking to for guidance? God speaks to you and each and every one of us in a way that is unique only to you. God does not speak to you the way God speaks to me. God speaks to us as individuals. Individually, we must have a relationship with God. Yes, corporately together we are the body of Christ, but God speaks to us in very unique ways because each and every one of us is individual and we all have individual gifts. We all have hang-ups, <laughs> that are individual just to us. God speaks to you in an individual way, in a very unique way. What God says to me, you might not understand. And what God says to you, I might not be able to comprehend. We are each and every one of us unique in God's creation. So how do we hear, how do we hear what God is trying to tell us. Well, I'm going to propose to you today that your receiver 
at hearing what God has to say is a dedicated and disciplined devotional life, which as 30 years of ministry have gone onward becomes more and more rare. A dedicated and disciplined devotional life. I want you to look at, this, look at it this way. God is always speaking. His frequency is always out there. Just like an FM frequency. I, was, I came of age in the 1970s, so I got to enjoy the best music that was ever produced. I'm sorry for those of you that did not come of age in the 1970s. I had Boston. I had Journey. I had Bachman Turner Overdrive, the Marshall Tucker Band, Leonard Skinner. Woo! I got some claps from the sound booth back there. So when I want to listen to 70s music, I've got XM radio on my truck. Channel 7 is 70s music. That's appropriate, isn't it? But the only way that I can hear that station is to tune in. We cannot hear the voice of God, folks, even though we think we do, unless we are tuned in to what God is trying to say. He's always speaking. A dedicated and disciplined devotional life. What, what do you see in your, what are the clouds, what is the pillar of clouds showing you in this wilderness? And I'm going to give you five things, and I'm going to do it briefly, and then we're going to close. Daily scheduled time with God is one way of tuning in to what God has to say. I'm not talking about prayer when I tell on this one, not on this first point. Daily scheduled time with God. You need to spend some time with God where you're not asking Him for something. If my son said he loved me and he never called me, and he never spent any time with me, it would be hard for me to believe that. How do you think God feels when we don't schedule time with him? Hey, Steve, uh, what are you doing Monday? Sorry, Lord, I'm busy. Well, what about Wednesday? Mm, sorry, Lord. What about Thursday? Uh, don't have time. Just spend time with God without asking him for anything. <laughs> Number two, you need a dedicated place and space to spend time with God. Mine is normally the garage. My place to spend time with God is the garage. I've usually got a woodworking project. Yesterday I was putting together this ridiculous plastic storage bin that had a thousand screws with it. I thought it was going to take me an hour or two. It took me all afternoon to put the thing together. But guess what? Guess who I was speaking with? Guess who I was communing with? It was my time to commune with God because the garage, of all places, is my dedicated place and space just to spend time with Him. Number three, you need a commitment to reading the Word of God. There are 66 books in the Bible, 39 are in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament. And I could go through and tell you how the, it's divided down between the Pentateuch and the words of the prophets and the wisdom literature and the gospels and the letters. And I could go all the way through that. But how much are we committed to reading his word? People died down through the centuries. Christians died in order to get the word of God printed in a language we could read. People gave their lives for it. And you can, read it on, you can read it on your electronic device, or you can be old school like me. I have, my biggest collection of books are Bibles in all different versions of the English language, because I can only read English. <laughs> Commit yourself to reading. I can always tell when someone has not been reading the Word of God simply by being in conversation with them for five minutes. Because there are some things, listen, a commitment to reading the Word of God will teach you a couple of things. It will teach you the vocabulary and the language of God. 
Reading the Bible will, will teach you God's language and God's vocabulary and the words that God's work use. I, I use expressions all the time that are biblical references and people look at me with a confused look because they don't understand the reference. If you say, I've been in this Sunday school class since Moses was a baby, some people look at you. Moses was a baby a long time ago. That's what that means. Amen. If you're at, with that coworker or that family member, you know, that irritating brother-in-law that you have. <laughs> I'm trying to be funny and I'm failing. I'm sorry. <laughs> if, you're, if you're dealing with that and the temptation and, and the thought comes into your mind, I'm going to cuss him out. Let me share something with you. That is not God's language and it's not God's vocabulary and you didn't learn that by reading the Bible. Okay? I had a woman come to me and wanted me to pray to her some one time that this particular man would be her husband. She was already married. She would already been married, been married for years, but she wanted another fella and I'm like, I don't think you know the language and vocabulary of God. <laughs> you know, I don't think you know that. Number four, a committed daily prayer life. Yes, you need to spend time with God without asking Him for anything, but you also need to ask Him for some things. Ask Him for wisdom. Ask Him for knowledge. Ask Him for patience. Ask Him for purity of heart and life. Ask Him to help you love more. Help, ask you to help. Ask him, God to help you to forgive. It's the largest sin of the Christian church in America. We are unable to forgive one another. Ask Him for the ability to forgive. A committed daily prayer life will change you. And people who don't pray simply don't want to change. They're happy being mean, unforgiving, stubborn, outspoken, and prideful. The ability to understand, understand God's will, the ability to understand God's will, the ability to hear God is tied in direct proportion to your prayer life. I can tell you this because I've experienced it, because I went through a lot of years without praying, without praying like I should, with poor, petty prayers. The ability to understand God's will is in direct proportion to your prayer life. God doesn't just want to hear a 911 emergency prayer. He wants you to make it a habit. And just like you need a space and a place to spend time with God, you need a place and a space that will be your war room. Have you seen the movie? It will be your war room. Number five, you need an obedient, an open and obedient heart. This one's the most important. As I stand here today, I, I had a sudden realization when I look back through some records because, you know, during this time I've, it's been a good time for Donna Joe to help me clean out and organize my files and organize my office and do some things that I normally don't have time for. And I discovered that today I'm preaching to you in the short time I have been here, my 144th sermon. Boy, that's a biblical number. Twelve tribes of Israel times twelve apostles, 144. Isn't that a great biblical number? My 144th sermon. So what I'm about to say to you, if you've never listened to anything else I've said before, I hope you'll listen to this. I'm going to start by telling you about the Old Farmer's Almanac. The Old Farmer's Almanac was first produced in 1792, 228 years ago. There was a man named Robert B. Thomas who wrote it, and it was in competition with lots of other Farmer's Almanacs at the time. It contained some folklore. It, it, it contained um, some Zodiac stuff. Uh, so it, 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 it did contain some superstition. But what it also contained was an amazing amount of scientific observation. 
to give farmers a time when they should plant their particular crops. For 228 years, the Old Farmer's Almanac has had an 80% success rate in predicting the weather. Is that not amazing? Farmers started taking, when it gained popularity, farmers would take the Old Farmer's Almanac, which was just, it was, it's always been printed in newspaper quality paper, not magazine quality. And they would take it, and up in the corner of where it was, they would take a nail and they would drive it on a post in the barn. Because they could go out to the barn and it was handy and they could thumb through it and they could look and remind themselves of when they were supposed to plant. That became so popular that in the early 1900s, the publishers of the Old Farmer's Almanac punched one hole in the top left corner of the Old Farmer's Almanac so that they could hang it on a nail in the barn and the, far and the, and the, and the farmer would not have to drive a nail through it. When, it was, when they were through with that year's almanac, it found its place on a nail in the outhouse. Not only did the weathered pages provide good toilet paper, it also provided reading material. Why do I say this to you? Folks, forgive me if I am uncompassionate toward a generation who in the midst of the worst pandemic in a century hoards toilet paper. Do you know for how many millennium human race survived without toilet paper? And so I was thinking, everybody born in 1996 and forward, those 24-year-olds and younger, Generation Z, what stories are they going to tell about how their elders did during the greatest pandemic in 100 years? Can you imagine the Generation Z when they have grandchildren of their own and they're sitting at their knee and they look up and say, Grandma, tell me about the great pandemic that happened in 2019 and 2020. And they're going to say, well, our elders hoarded toilet paper. Is that what they're going to say? Is that how we are going to be remembered. What do you see in the clouds? God's given you lots of signs. Pillar of fire by night, pillar of cloud by day. What's, what kind of clarity are you getting while we're wandering around in the wilderness? Are you going to be changed when you come out of this? Or are you still going to be the same old greedy, mean, critical person some people are going to come out of this pandemic and, and come back to church and they're still going to have stinking thinking. Just stinking thinking. And some people are going to come out of this pandemic completely changed and completely transformed because they've attended to their devotional life. They found a way to tune in to the voice of God. And they've heard what God is telling them uniquely as an individual. What God is telling them. We're going to come back to church one day, folks. Stop losing your mind over it. Now, I want to say this to those of you who have been faithful to the church down through the years. Thank you. For those of you who are my elders and old enough to be my parents, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for teaching Sunday school to children. I thank you for being here every time the door is open. My heart breaks for you because I know your heart is breaking because you want to be back at church. You want to be back at church because you miss the other people of faith that you get to gather with and study with and pray with. You miss that. Thank you. Thank you for everything you've done down through the years. We would not be here without you. But I want you to hear this statistic, and I'm going to say it three different ways, because I don't want you to misunderstand. 80% of the people that have been born in 1996 and later, 80% of those people are not in church. I'm going to say it this way. 80% of the 24-year-olds and younger are not in church. 
I'm going to say it this way. Only 20% of those 24 and younger are in church. The surest way to run a young person off from church is put them on a committee with people on the committee who have stinking thinking. They won't come back. We need to repent. We're in the wilderness, folks. The only reason the governor loosened loosened the requirements for us to meet is for economic reasons. This pandemic is not over by a long shot. We are still in the wilderness, and people are still dying. And if you've seen anyone die from this horrible virus, you won't be so flippant in your attitude. You won't be so prideful. It breaks my heart that we're not here together, but this is important. And this is not about a lack of faith. This is about having sense enough to get in out of the rain. This is not about a lack of faith. I knew a man, and he was a good Christian man. I, 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 was pers- I per- knew him personally. He loved to play golf. And he was a good golfer. And he was playing the round of his life. He was scoring lower than he'd ever scored before. And it was coming up a thundercloud. And he said, oh, I'm going to be fine. I have faith that God's going to take care of me. And on the 16th hole, he was struck by lightning. Afterwards, and listen, it was a hard, long recovery. He almost didn't make it. He almost died. And he had lots of physical problems afterwards. One problem was he never got to play golf again because he couldn't swing a golf club. You know what he said? God gave me sense enough to get in off that golf course in a lightning storm, and I didn't do it. So staying at home and being safe is not not an expression of a lack of faith. It's just having sense enough (laughs) to get in out of a thunderstorm. We're going to come back to church together, I promise. But if you can't have faith outside these walls, you've got a spiritual problem. If you can't be a disciple of Jesus when you're in the wilderness and when you're in exile, how can you have faith in Jesus when you're in the building? There is not a minister alive who is not heartbroken that we cannot come together as the corporate body of Christ and worship. We all want to come back. You would have come back this Sunday if I thought the lightning storm was gone. We would have come back, you know, all of us want to be here. I want to see you. I appreciate your flat families that you put, but I miss you. I miss the flesh and blood, you, and your presence, and I want you back. And that day will come. But as long as we are in the wilderness, we have to find clarity in the clouds. This is a great time to build your faith. Those of you that have been calling me, keep calling me. (laughs) Some of you have called me and you've wept because we haven't been together and I've wept with you. Just keep calling me. We'll weep together and we'll get through it. Weeping lasts for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Joy comes in the morning. We'll be back together. We will. But for now, we've got to find clarity in the clouds. Father, we love you, we praise you, we thank you that even in exile, even in the wilderness, you were with us. God, we thank you that this is a time of transformation, this is a time of building our faith. This is not a time for lack of faith. This is a time to strengthen our faith. God, help us all to develop a fully fully developed devotional life toward you so that we can hear you when you speak because, Lord, you speak all the time. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. Amen. Send me an email. Send me a text. Call me. I love you. Jesus loves you too.